people underestimate the power of curiosity. To look at the world around you and ask good questions of it, that will take you on some really exciting journeys. Fishing is a journey, yeah, just like life. It's kind of a microcosm of life, little things you have to overcome. If you're not catching fish, you gotta change something. You know, change your fly, change your cast, change the water, change where you're standing. And so in life, things aren't working. You gotta figure things out, change stuff. For me, fishing is about the process. It's, it's about the activity of everything that's involved, the whole gestalt of it. It's not about how many fish you caught. Paul, do you feel the same way about art? It's art about the painting on the wall. I hardly ever look at paintings I finished uh, that's on the wall. I'm always thinking about the next one. I guess that's the journey. My mom would say she could never discipline me by sending me to my room, because I'd be real happy just, you know, working on some con contraption. I was real comfortable uh, uh, with my hands, like erector sets and Lincoln logs and Tinker Toys, mainly erector set. You know, I, I could just, you know, play and build things. You know, I, I look in this book here, it's over 60 years old, and, you know, I just build stuff in this book. And I never asked myself why I'm doing this. I just enjoyed, you know, enjoyed assembling things and doing it. My mom painted. She always had an easel set up and you could smell oil paints in the house. And when I was little, I'd watch her all the time. And I was just fascinated. Then I never had any art other than what you do in what, second, third grade, until I was in my 40s when I started this adventure. When Paul was just a kid, he was naturally curious about the world around him. He fell in love with technology as an Eagle Scout, mastering Morse code and even building his own ham radio in the corner of his bedroom. Right out of high school, he got hired at HP Labs and worked there for four summers, all while earning an electrical engineering degree from Cal Berkeley. He was commissioned an officer in the Air Force and worked in a research lab, where he was awarded a medal for technical contributions and granted a US patent. And as if that wasn't enough, he went on to get his MBA from Harvard. It was there, at Harvard, standing on a footbridge on the evening of October 23rd, 1977, that the spark of an idea came to Paul. What if I could combine something technical with something aesthetic? Once this idea took root in Paul, he set off on a journey to discover all that is possible when you combine art and technology. 
If you look at people that were curious, there's probably no one more curious than Leonardo da Vinci. There was this Leonardo da Vinci show, all these wooden replicas, models of Leonardo's uh, inventions. Now here's a guy that was an engineer and designed machinery, and he's painted two of the most famous paintings in the world. And then they had cases with uh, his notebooks and stuff. What would happen if you tried to combine the technology of today and art? I came out of there and said, man, this is what I want to do. This is where my heart is. I kept having conversations with Paul and artists and art historians and art professors about the meaning of what, what is art, you know, in a very serious way. Like, what is art and what is not art? And so before I ever saw the art or what Paul was capable of without Dulcinea, I was captivated by the idea of how far the boundary could be pushed. He's the forever student. Anything that he gets interested in or finds or doesn't know anything about and wants to, he'll research it to the nth degree. So I loved computers, I loved technology, I loved art, didn't know anything about art, didn't know anything about a machine shop, but took a Votech class for that, started taking many, many art classes, start acquiring all the pieces that I needed to do what I'm doing now. And that kind of led to my 20 plus year journey of building a robot named Dulcinea that now paints uh, autonomously overnight and creates paintings for me. <laughs> How do you teach yourself about robotics? That's a good question. I flew to San Jose and attended a one-week class on how to program a robot and then another week on how the robot vision works. Then started building my machine using CAD in the machine shop. And then I built the whole robot behind me. So this was the first design. You know, I've added on, like I've added this fence that holds all the paint. And that's the roller system there. And then configured the operating system. This is where I've spent years and hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Just layers and layers and layers of software. Complex adaptive systems. Each line here is one brush stroke. Rule based expert system. I can change the length of the strokes, the density of the strokes, the number of the strokes, the color of the strokes. The fluids hitting each other and swirling around and hitting. And then that goes to disk. And then I pull it up in my Lisp environment. Now I can hit this button here and it ships it over to the robot. And then I can just say, Let's paint that. This is all the electronics for the robot work cell. So the X and Y, the Z motor first. This is the optical encoder. There's a timing belt down here and up there. And this is just the spring from a screen door. <laughs> <laughs> to be fully automated, you need uh, to be able to change paint and uh, also seal the paint. Another piece I had to build was this vertical brush washer here. Second robot's going up and down. The first robot's going left and right and twisting. And I do a pre-wash and a post-wash, and then it takes the dirty water away. Yeah, it can take a while to understand what Paul is talking about. The reason his processes are so complex and so difficult to understand is because Paul has a rule for Dulcinea. Everything she does needs to be original artwork. Dulcinea doesn't copy paintings. She creates paintings. And these paintings begin long before her brush ever touches a canvas. They begin with an idea simulated by thousands of lines of code. Paul's ideas can come from anywhere, say the swirls in his cappuccino, or clusters of galaxies, or the movement of ants. Let's look at ants. In this simulation, you've got a picnic blanket that operates like a grid. This becomes your virtual world where all the magic happens. In this picnic blanket world, there are tiny little breadcrumbs scattered around the grid. Then, because these little breadcrumbs have fallen onto the picnic blanket, you also have ants. Hundreds of hungry ants, just sort of wandering around, looking for food. Eventually, after enough wandering around, one of these ants finds a breadcrumb and drops a pebble as a marker. Another ant might find this pebble, and so he puts a pebble next to it. And after a while, all the pebbles that the ants have been dropping are turned into coordinates and then transformed into unique brush strokes. What's really exciting is that each time this computer simulation is run, these ants find different crumbs and drop pebbles in different ways. And so you have these new and surprising patterns of brush strokes emerging with every painting. 
And this is just one of the many simulations that Paul uses for creating original works of art. So I don't think there's a real analog for what Paul's doing anywhere, which is part of why I think people have a hard time understanding it, but it's part of what makes it important. In parallel building the robot and learning this stuff, I uh, took a lot of art classes for several years. And I was fortunate to take classes from David LaFell. David would say, the brush stroke, the brush stroke is the heart and soul of painting. There are two things you can describe with a brush stroke. One is form and the other is direction. So form is going across and direction is along. With a brush stroke, your arm is away from your body, your armpit is open, and you're just seeing the whole painting instead of just, you see. Here everything is angular, here everything is open. And every stroke is, uh, has exquisite deliberation. That's the key. So if, if you're going to try and make a painting at that level, then you have to have a wrist that can make an exquisite brush stroke. The uh, president CEO of America's largest robot company said the first thing you should do is build a wooden mock-up of the wrist. So you have a roll, and you have a pitch, and then you have a roll. And uh, similar to pitch, jar and roll, but in the ro robotics world, this is a better model. And I could visualize, you know, how you'd put these three together to make a brush stroke. If you don't have all six joints, there's no way you can make, you know, a beautiful articulated brush stroke. The most interesting thing about Dulcinea is that she's made up of a series of complex systems that if you take them apart, tell you what it means to be an artist. So if a visual artist needs to think through colors, Paul has created a way where Dulcinea can think through colors. If an artist needs to think about brush stroke and the haptic capacity of an artist, Dulcinea has had to learn brush stroke. If an artist needs to clean and attend to their tools, Dulcinea can do that. Dulcinea has a brush washer. Would an engineer come up with something that was that passionate about washing brushes? No. You couldn't come up with Dulcinea unless your heart was in both computer science and art. I've had this 25-year journey of this fusion of art and science, or art, science, math, robotics, etc. And, and that's that, that magic of finding what you want to do. It might be just one thing, but in my case, it's this fusion thing of putting together the things that you like to do with a unique vision. It's a unique idea and a unique dream. And 
I think a lot of people are living less balanced lives because they don't realize that fusioneering is possible, that bringing together things that they're passionate about could actually create one trajectory. They think it still has to stay two, and then your heart is in one place while your work is somewhere else. And I think Paul has found a way to show us that that's not the only way we need to go through life. My experiences with Paul, he's got an incredible mind. He's extremely creative. He's very giving. And he's a good friend. And Linda was a great compliment to Paul. Linda was um, very kind and uh, very sincere uh, and very giving. When we moved into this house, and, uh, you know, both of us getting home from work and she made this dinner. We'd be at the dining room table over there looking out on the lake and <laughs> before sitting down, I'd say, we're living the dream. We're living the dream. And within four weeks, she was dead. Someone asked me a few months ago how I felt about uh, how I felt after she died, and um, I didn't have an answer. I, di I didn't know how to answer the question. How do you express a, a gut-wrenching, tragic moment? I wanted to do a painting uh, in memory of Linda and in honor of her and my love and, and also in the process of doing the painting, I'd be close to her. And I realized doing this painting uh, was my uh, way of handling my grief. I think artists are more able to comprehend and process tragedy than most people because they have an avenue with which to look at it, deal with it, a lens and a frame to put it in and a way to organize it inside of themselves so that it makes something and for Paul, the painting that he did allowed him to explore it and to be able to touch parts of it that might be too difficult for most people to touch. The painting was the most uh, difficult I've done conceptually and then artistically and technically. How do you capture the moment of death on a canvas? What's that look like? Let me open this one. I don't know how many paintings he did before he did this last one, but it was a lot. And I had this opportunity to meet a, a, a Native American shaman, and she explained that in her tribe, after someone dies, they believe that the spirit goes through realms of the afterlife. I thought that had a real beautiful visual quality to that explanation. So then I came up with the idea of layers of mist, which eventually became kind of cloud structures, and then a curve representing the spirit moving through, through these realms. So this is uh, earlier on in the painting. I'm trying to develop the mist, the, the clouds. And so this is on uh, different runs, run 10, 11, 12, 13, etc. I spent months trying to build uh, this exquisite robotic brush strokes. Eventually, I revisited the work of one of my favorite sculptors, Bernini. The curves in his sculptures have such a delicate quality, I thought, what would one of those curves look like as a brushstroke? I want the ending to be unresolved, and I want the viewer to have a little bit be unsettled because there's no answer, nobody has an answer, and I, I wanted to capture that. Now I just have these few fleeting uh, brush strokes up there going off, and that's how I decided to end the painting. I, I think uh, Linda would be quietly pleased with her painting. Dulcinea is, is an extension of Paul. 
he chooses what paint the arm is going to dip into and the kind of brushstroke the arm is going to make. So in that sense, Dulcinea is just his form of expression. It's incredible. Paul is an artist at least twice, maybe three times over. His own art that he has made with his own hands, not collaborating with Dulcinea, is beautiful and technically incredible. Paul is also an artist in that he thinks about art more than most artists think about art, because to create Dulcinea, he had to understand art in ways nobody else does. And Paul's also an artist because he's using incredibly broad tools that other artists don't even have access to because they're not willing to admit that that might be a possibility. You want to find out what the constraints are, what the limitations are, and if you can override them. Well, Paul, why don't you just paint? If I just painted, I wouldn't be able to play with computers and robotics and my machine shop and, you know, all, all this other stuff that I get to do. I'm a fusioneer. And so for me, a fusioneer is a person that's doing multiple things and has developed some expertise in these and he's putting them together to fulfill this unique dream, this unique goal. Paul teaches us that we are capable of things that we never thought were possible. That who you are as a person showing up just as yourself and doing the things that just you care about is of enormous value. Pursue your dream. And the dream is not about the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The dream is finding these things that fascinate you, that excite you. I've never had a bad day in 25 years going to work because I found my path. That was good, huh? <laughs>